Okay, so it's time and we start. Okay, so uh, let me um, uh, give a warm welcome to everyone who is joining us from all over the world. Uh, Critical Transition Complex Systems Seminar Series is being uh, jointly hosted by IIT Madras in India and Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research Germany. This seminar series brings together experts from uh, diverse fields such as climate science, combustion, neuroscience, fluid mechanics, etc., and aims to disseminate the state of the art in the prediction of critical transitions uh, in these diverse fields of study. And uh, we are really fortunate to have many eminent speakers in our webinar series. And the seminar series takes place every month on the last Monday. Uh, of course, the time depends on the place you are, but I'll send you the link, so mark your calendars. Uh, before introducing the speaker, a few housekeeping notes, I request everyone to turn off their microphones. And there's a Q&A box in the Zoom chat box, or a Q&A box, and you can type your questions there, which I can read out for the speaker, or the speaker can herself answer. We'll have enough time at the end of the talk to discuss these questions and clarifications. So now let me introduce the speaker and my good friend, Katharina Krischer. Uh, Katharina Krischer is a professor at GE Munich. She investigates uh, fundamental aspects of self-organization pattern formation under non-equilibrium conditions. Her work includes experiments which mainly focus on non-linear phenomena at the solid liquid interface and theory. In the theoretical work, she bridges the gap between system-specific models a normal form type approaches. Since 2002, she is a professor of physics at the TU Munich in Germany, and she has co authored about 130 publications in peer reviewed journals, as well as written a, a nice textbook on physics of energy conversion. She was elected a fellow of the International Society of Electrochemistry and is also a member of the German Physical Society and the Society of German Chemists. Uh, today, she will be speaking about synchrony and turbulence. In particular, she will speak about the Rich dynamics of globally coupled Stuart Lambda oscillators. So, without taking any further time, I give the microphone to Katharina. You can share your slides. Oops. Sorry. Uh, Let me see. Yeah. Green button. Okay, this didn't work. Let's try again. Okay. Okay. Now it should work. Yeah. Let me go to the full screen. Okay, last thing is that I get the laser pointer. And well, then I would like to thank the organizers, especially Sujit for the invitation. I've enjoyed the seminar series a lot so far, I have to say, and this might be one of the very, very few positive outcomes of COVID that we are having these seminars, webinars um, around the world with people connected from the Americas um, uh, to Asia. So I'm very happy and glad that I <clears throat> can tell you what we have been thinking about or dealing with during the last years. Um, you see, my talk is about globally coupled oscillators. And before I say a few words through introductory words, let me introduce my coworkers or, and co-authors of this uh, talk. These are essentially two graduate students who have recently finished, Felix Kemet and uh, Sintra Hogland. And here I would also acknowledge financial support from several um, agencies. Okay, let me set the stage. Understanding the dynamics of coupled oscillators is important, well, essentially across all disciplines. And I have selected a few examples here ranging from power grid networks, which are probably the largest man-made machines that exist. So each power generator can be viewed as an oscillator. And for the functioning of the network of the power grid, it's very important that all the uh, generators are synchronized and there's a lot of work on synchronization of um, power grids <clears throat> and also uh, not uh, or failures of power grids because of synchronization failures 
in the literature, which is a very important application of coupled oscillators. Let's go from these largest machines to very small machines. And these are an example of these small machines are nano-electromechanical oscillators, which are produced by <clears throat> Um, lithography, and you see here an example, nano-electromechanical oscillators, a hybrid oscillator with mechanical and electric degrees of freedom, and their coupling can give rise to a large variety of different behaviors as nicely, for example, demonstrated in this reference. Very other or important examples include biological examples, Last but not least, neural networks, where, well, the uh, literature is probably um, largest of all specific system of coupled oscillators, and there's a lot of activities in this work. And finally, you can also go to uh, sociology, for example, and also study synchronization behavior of clapping audiences. So essentially, understanding the dynamics of couple oscillators is something that people is important in different disciplines, in nearly all disciplines, but it can be viewed from a um, well general universal point of view. And most of these networks here, at least part of their behavior, can be de um, described by phase oscillators. Phase, if you look at phase uh, models, each oscillator has only a single degree of freedom, and this is its phase. And then the dynamics of the network is described as uh, shown here, so that each oscillator has its own frequency, or the oscillators might have the uh, identical frequency or um, some uh, frequency distribution. And they are coupled through some coupling function. And as has been demonstrated, for example, by Karamoto, it depends essentially or often you can describe it as uh, depending on the difference between two, um, the phases of two oscillators, which means we have um, a, a linear coupling. Now the coupling function can, <clears throat> be uh, very different, of course, depending on the behavior and of the um, individual oscillators you want to describe on the coupling connectivity. But the foundational model is uh, the Kuramoto model, which is shown here. So here we have a simple harmonic coupling, pairwise coupling of just uh, two oscillators as described here. And as Kuramoto showed in the 70s, this ensemble of coupled phase oscillators is a beautiful example of a nonlinear phase transition. And as you increase the coupling strength K, you observe your heterogeneous, slightly heterogeneous ensemble of oscillators to start synchronize. And as you, if you measure the degree of synchronization, the degree of coherence in your system by this complex order parameter where the magnitude of the order parameter gives the um, degree of coherence and psi the phase gives the phase of the ever uh, uh, corresponds to the average phase of your oscillator system you see that the degree of coherence smoothly starts to increase at a threshold coupling strength and then saturates um, at close to one <clears throat> for large coupling strengths. Okay, this behavior has been also um, verified in uh, experiments. And I said it's a most known, probably the most important model for coupled oscillators. But of course, phase oscillators, which I said work in the weak coupling limit, um, are also studied in different settings where the coupling function, for example, is augmented by a phase lag parameter alpha. You can think of the phase lag parameter alpha, for example, as introducing some delay between the instantaneous uh, state of the phase 
and um, the coupling can introduce higher harmonics. And this is necessary if the individual oscillation has a kind of relaxation type character. You can introduce nonlinear coupling. Here we have essentially linear coupling, and this nonlinear coupling has been extensively studied by Pekowski, Rosenblum, and co workers during the last um, 10 years and gives again rise to different phenomena. So there is a large body of work on phase oscillators. And the phase oscillators models may describe different behavior, except of the synchronization. You might get uh, phase clusters as indicated here that the oscillators aggregate in two or three um, or even more groups in the, kind, uh, in the case when you have higher harmonics. And within each group, the oscillators um, are uh, synchronized and behave the same. So again, here, the collective behavior has just a few degrees of freedom. The phase lag parameter can lead to a continuous um, distribution of the phases on the unit circle. So this is a complex plane here. And nonlinear uh, coupling, for example, can lead to quasi-periodic behavior where the average um, of um, the ensemble, which is indicated here, is oscillating at a frequency that is incommensurate to the frequencies of the individual oscillators, so that the mean behavior gives rise to a self-organized quasi periodicity. Okay, so although these phase models are extremely um, successful in describing many different behaviors in a very general way, elucidating the important feedbacks, the important features of your system at hand, which you like to understand. There are situations where the phase description breaks down. And here is, or are two examples from our lab. So as Sujit mentioned in the introduction, we are also doing experiments. These experiments are electrochemical experiments. I will not go into detail uh, of the experiments, but <clears throat> sorry, um, just show you a few examples. And what you see here are a bunch of oscillators, which, uh, well, came from different positions on our oscillating electrode which is a corrosion experiment actually, which, be, uh, which clustered, you see the green oscillators and the blue oscillators. And I think to start it once more my video, I have to go back and forth again, okay. And now if you look at the motion of the oscillator, so I don't know why this doesn't start again, but you probably saw that each of these clusters moves and the, at the edges of a Möbius strip. And this means that amplitude variations are in fact important. So such a behavior, you will never be able to describe just with a phase uh, model. The same is true for the example here. So this was an experiment where we found a bunch of oscillators to synchronize. These are shown in green, and these are actually much more oscillators that are hidden in this green synchronized cl cluster. And all the others, spread widely and irregular in the uh, complex plane and oscillate. And actually, this is an example of a, a chimera state. A chimera state um, denotes a dynamical system which displays a coexistence between synchrony, our green oscillator, which oscillates simply harmonic, and incoherence, which is displayed by these blue oscillators. Now, if you have to look into the dynamics of the amplitude degree of freedom, a prototypical model example or model would be the Stuart Lander oscillator. The Stuart Lander oscillator is most often um, described as in uh, with this equation, where <clears throat> You use a complex variable and have a linear destabilizing 
and a stabilizing cubic nonlinear term. If you um, formulate the stuart lunder oscillator in terms of polar coordinates, you see that the only um, parameter in the stuart lunder oscillator, C2, gives you the angular frequency of the oscillator. And now, in order to understand our experiments, but from a larger perspective, make a contribution to the dynamics of amplitude oscillators and to understand phenomena that go, cannot be described with a phase reduction. We looked into globally coupled Stuart Lander oscillators. On the one hand, I'm going to talk about this type of globally coupled Stuart Lander oscillators, where we have a linear global coupling, so this bracketed. Uh, um, Corner brackets mean that we take the average, the ensemble average. This is a global feedback to the dynamics on each individual oscillator. And the fact that the current state of each oscillator is subtracted means that we have what is called a diffusive coupling, which vanishes in the presence of a synchronous uniform state. And we have here this complex uh, parameter of our um, system, which is a coupling um, constant. Later, I will show that you get an even much more richer behavior when you look at nonlinear globally coupled system, similar to the ansatz of Rosenblum and Pikowski, who studied the nonlinear uh, coupling with phase oscillators. We couple here our amplitude oscillators nonlinearly, and I will demonstrate that this type of coupling gives rise to really an enormous uh, variety of different states. But let us start with um, Stuart Lunder os um, oscillator that have a linear global coupling. Okay, also here, there's of course some literature. And in our context, important or noteworthy is the paper, which is nearly 30 years old by Nakagawa and uh, Kuramoto. They studied exactly the equation which I introduced in my last transparency. And they say that there are two base solutions in this equation, which are on the one hand, one cluster state. And what they call a one cluster state is a completely synchronized <coughs> um, solution which is uh, shown here. So here we have a <clears throat> uniform oscillation of all um, the stuart lander oscillators. On the other hand, in uh, this parameter range B, we have an incoherent state, a uniform distribution of all the phases in the, on the, um, uh, uh, unit circle <clears throat> or, uh, between zero and two pi. And in the one cluster state, we clearly have an order parameter of magnitude one, whereas the order parameter, and in this case, a complex order parameter vanishes in the case of the uniform um, distribution or an incoherent uh, behavior of the phases. But Kuramoto and Nakagawa also discussed are the stability limits of these two main states. And they are shown here with LB for the uniform distribution, of the phase limit, and LA for the one cluster state. And K is the coupling strength. You can see that at low coupling strength, where we have essentially the limit of the phase model where a phase description would be possible, we have either uniform distribution of phase limits or a one cluster state. And we have a region which is called C here, where both of these states are unstable. So the uniform distribution is unstable above the line LB and the one cluster state is unstable below the line LA. And we have clearly then because these lines cross here by stability of both states in region D. And in region C, 
a large variety of different collective behavior, which is unique to amplitude um, oscillators, coupled amplitude oscillators. Roughly, there can be this collective behavior can be uh, discriminated or um, classified in two groups. On the one hand, we have point clusters, and these are two or three cluster solutions. Or we can have string-like continuous distribution in the complex plane that move chaotically around, actually, and present high-dimensional chaotic dynamics. In the following, I will dig or look a little bit closer into these cluster states. And in particular, we focus on cluster states as indicated here, where we have two clusters. One of the clusters has a larger amplitude than the uniform oscillation, which is uh, one, and one of them has a, a slower amplitude. When you read Kuramoto's paper carefully, you'll find that he says, well, the um, bifurcation to clustering is a new or novel type of emergent behavior, which is, well, that was 30 years ago, not, um, or very difficult to describe because um, it involves an enormous, large variety of different um, clusters which are possible in ensembles of N oscillators. And we approached this question and I will kind of guide you through our type of understanding what we contributed to the dynamics of these um, two cluster states. Well, here you see again, the glow equation of motion describing the globally coupled Stuart Lander oscillators with a linear coupling. For our work, we rewrote the coupling constant a little bit so that we write it now as alpha plus E beta. It's easier to understand the dynamics if you first look at a smaller ensemble of oscillators. So looks, uh, here we look at 16 coupled oscillators and we studied the bifurcations of this oscillator. And the bifurcation diagram where the radius of one cluster is shown on this axis and the parameter beta on this axis is shown here. In black, we have the synchronous solution. The synchronous solution becomes unstable in this point which is called TS. This is essentially a Benjamin Fair instability. And after, at much small, or uh, at larger values actually of beta, it is step, uh, stabilized again in another Benjamin Fair instability. All the colored branches here refer to cluster um, solutions, two cluster solutions. And you have all the different uh, possibilities between 15 to one, if you have 16 coupled oscillators up to the balanced cluster, which has eight oscillators in each cluster. And as you can see, all of these cluster solutions emerge in a saddle node bifurcation. All but one, all but the uh, balanced cluster solution and the balanced cluster solution emerges at a Benjamin fear instability in a pitchfork bifurcation. And you can see that the same scenario you find essentially up here as well. However, here we have, um, yeah, now let me uh, put it a little bit uh, different. Let's first discuss further the stability of these branches. But the most unbalanced cluster here um, is spawn, or at least one branch of the, uh, that is spawn in saddle node bifurcation is a stable branch. For all, all the other saddle node bifurcations create unstable, uh, only unstable two cluster solutions. But all of these unstable two cluster solutions are eventually stabilized in 
a transverse bifurcation of the two cluster solutions. And so they have some existence range here. And actually each two cluster solution, or there exist two variants of each two cluster solution. One where the larger cluster is, <clears throat> um, has a smaller uh, amplitude smaller than one, and one where the larger cluster with a fixed, uh, 16 oscillator, for example, has a amplitude larger than one. And these two different um, solutions are connected or go transcritically through the Benjamin fair instability, which is a highly, um, or which is an equivariant um, bifurcation. Okay, so we stabilize all our two cluster solutions eventually in a transverse bifurcation where the oscillator, uh, the, the directions transverse to the cluster manifold are involved and they're also destabilized at a different um, transcritical bifurcation. And you already can anticipate here that there is some parameter range where these two different types of each cluster solution co um, coexist. And what does it mean for an experiment? Well, there you are essentially interested in the stable solution. Let's assume we are there very slowly, adiabatically slow, change our bifurcation parameter. <clears throat> well, then you would typically obtain the following picture. So you start on your synchronous state. At some point, the synchronous state becomes unstable. And then in a step-like manner, you fall from one cluster state to the next, to the next, to the next, wherever where you are first in the most unbalanced cluster. And then one um, oscillator of the large cluster transitions to the small, um, smaller cluster and so on. So this is a cascade of cluster states which you transverse as you increase slowly your parameter beta, you come through the 8-8 solution and then you enter the sister, let's say the other type of <clears throat> uh, two cluster solutions. So this 7-9 uh, <clears throat> is, let's say the sister of the nine uh, uh, seven solution here until eventually you go up to the synchronized solution again. As you go in the other direction, and this we uh, do here now, you enter first the second um, branch or staircase, let's say, and essentially then eventually come to the same cluster solutions as before, but with a considerable hysteresis and enter or, or jump in a hysteretic manner uh, to the uh, synchronous solution again. Okay, this was now a scenario, it was a bifurcation analysis for fixed values of our other two parameters, namely alpha and C2. Now you can of course change also those. And next I change C to, uh, um, alpha. This was our second coupling parameter. And I follow the set of node bifurcations in my parameter plane now spent by alpha and beta. And first we recognize here again, the Benjamin fear instability in the, uh, which forms this blue line. Then we have all the different set of node bifurcations, which merge in a single point to, well, spread from there again. And this single point where they merge is dumped a cluster singularity. It's a co-dimension two point which unfolds the emergence and the stabilities actually of all the two cluster states which exist in well, our <clears throat> uh, coupled uh, ensemble of Stuart-Lander oscillators. And 
together with the satellite bifurcations, also the two types of transverse bifurcations um, merge to this point. Now, what is the difference when you go through the cluster singularity? As we now changed before, I showed you a scenario where we changed beta. Now let's look at three different variations of alpha. And let's start with a situation where a two cluster state is stable and we start with a balanced cluster state below here. Now we have 100 oscillators and we increase alpha on one side of the cluster singularity. And here you see how you <clears throat> go again stepwise from the balanced state to more and more unbalanced states until you meet the synchronous solution. When you are on the other side of the cluster singularity and you again start with a balanced state, you the um, opposite solution, the, the sister solutions, I called it before, are involved in this transition. And <clears throat> you again go into a stepwise manner uh, to the synchronous solution. However, when you start from the balanced state and go directly through the cluster singularity, you go through a pitchfork bifurcation. The balanced state is the only state which is born in a pitchfork bifurcation. And so what, what is happening is that the amplitudes become more and more um, similar until they merge with a synchronous solution and you're back here. Okay, so we looked so far at a bifurcation sequence. And let me try to kind of see whether we can get, or this suggests what I told you, a somewhat larger picture behind it. So we have, let's first look at a kind of skeleton bifurcation diagram of the, around the cluster singularity. And this is indicated here. So on the one hand, we have our outermost saddle node bifurcation, which leads to the most unbalanced state, having a, um, a distribution of n minus one cluster in one and one class, uh, individual oscillator in the other one. And this is here described by this blue curve again in the alpha uh, beta plane. Then we have our Benjamin Fear instability to the transverse instability of the uniform oscillation, which is shown in black here, also touching the cluster singularity. And then we have of the balanced state, the um, two transverse bifurcation, which stabilize the balanced state and destabilize it so that the balanced state would be stable in this region. Okay, now we have seen we have a whole cascade of set and out bifurcations. And this cascade of set and out bifurcation takes place between the outer curve and the curve which uh, gives rise to the balanced state, TS, to the Benjamin Fear instability. So in this region, when we have not 16 clusters, but more, we will have a continuous band of uh, saddle node bifurcations and at both sides of the cluster singularity involving the corresponding uh, sister solutions of the uh, cluster composition. Then we have a cascade of the transverse bifurcations which stabilize um, the cluster solutions. <clears throat> they start somewhere um, between the outermost saddle node bifurcation and the Benjamin fear, bi uh, fear, bi uh, fear bifurcation here and go up to the balanced state. So here we have a second band of this transverse bifurcations, which exists on the other side for the sister states as well and corresponds to this band. And then we have our second transverse bifurcation in which the cluster solutions become again unstable. And this band starts in between <clears throat> the Benjamin Fair instability and the balanced state 
leading to some bistability, which I already pointed out and extends correspondingly to the other side. So now we are talking about these bifurcations. Well, I think this gives already quite a nice picture around or how the dynamics of these uh, two-phase clusters um, can be described, how they emerge, how they are stabilized. But of course, everything was um, numerically and based on what I showed you so far, one bifurcation diagram um, <clears throat> where I was more quantitative for only 16 oscillators. Actually, and this is now work we did together with Bernhard Fiedler, you can go much further. And here you can utilize the symmetry of your uh, system. What I think I forgot to mention, but what is important is that we are considering here um, identical oscillators. So our ensemble of Stuart Lander oscillators has full mutation, uh, permutation symmetry, a full SN symmetry. And dictated by the symmetry, you can deduce that <coughs> the, um, class, uh, the center manifold in which the um, cluster singularity lives is N minus uh, one dimensional if you have N um, oscillators. And so this, if you now think a little bit more general of some uh, typical individual oscillator, which has D variables, um, then this is a reduction of the dynamics by a factor of D. And furthermore, you can show that the dynamics of the individual coupling unit now, which is one dimensional is described by this normal form where you go to the third um, order. And moreover, and here I don't go into detail because it's a tedious uh, discussion, I would say, and a, a kind of tedious um, a formula one would uh, need to go through, but you can derive analytically the position of the different bifurcations I discussed so far. And you can derive the results as a function of the ratio of one of the clusters to the um, uh, ratio of the size of one of the clusters to the entire ensemble size, which is um, shown here, which kind of confirms what I indicated before, that as you go with n towards infinity, there is a continuous band of bifurcation curves between n over one uh, go approaching zero and n over one approaching one for all of the three different um, oscillators. Okay, this was more or less the first part of what I wanted to share with you about the linear globally coupled oscillators. And I think you already saw that the behavior even for the simplest so far a phenomenon that cannot be described in the phase uh, model limit, it can be very complex. Nevertheless, we have experiments, these are our electrochemical experiments, where we can show that we need a nonlinear global coupling. So we also investigated non uh, Stuart Lander oscillators with a nonlinear global coupling. I already showed this before. This equation, so we have a cubic nonlinear term here. These uh, um, corner brackets again mean that the average is taken. <clears throat> and if you see what this coupling does um, in the ensemble is, or, or this can be easily seen when you take the average of your equations of motion, then you see that the average itself is governed by the equation of a harmonic oscillator, which means whatever you do, your uniform oscillation will uh, oscillate harmonically. With other words, this nonlinear global coupling in this case introduces the con um, a conservation constraint <clears throat> which forces the average 
on a certain limit cycle, which is given by this equation. So with the amplitude nu and the um, angular frequency amplitude mu, sorry, or eta, sorry, and the angular frequency um, nu. Actually, I am not digging into the experiment so much uh, today, but this type of nonlinear global coupling we derived from experiments where we found that spatially we find a large variety of different patterns, but the entire system, the, the average, if you want the order parameter, always oscillates um, uniformly. Okay. Now let's see which type of solutions we can expect in this um, system. But what we did here is we did a bifurcation analysis starting from the synchronized solution and assuming we only go to uh, two clusters. So we have set up the equations describing the two cluster um, uh, situation. And what is important here is to see that from the synchronized solution, we can go in a pitch fog bifurcation to amplitude clusters. And actually this behavior should be very similar to the behavior we discussed for the linear global couple. But we also have the possibility for the synchronized solution to be destabilized in a Hopf bifurcation. And then we obtain a, a modulated amplitude clusters. So also the Hopf bifurcation not only leads to a second oscillation for the synchronous mode, or actually in our case, the synchronous mode is, is um, conserved, but we form two clusters and these two clusters um, are, uh, are modulated. So I would like to emphasize here that this picture is also much or is simplified or realistically the Hopf bifurcation is equivalent Hopf bifurcation and we at the same time um, obtain modulated amplitude clusters of various sizes and various stabilities. But nevertheless, let's see <clears throat> what, where we can go um, from here. Okay, first of all, I would like to point out that since the uniform oscillation is conserved. The uniform oscillation describes a national rotating reference frame. And everything I will show now will be in this co-rotating frame. And in the co-rotating frame, our modulated clusters from before look <clears throat> like or, or move on a limit cycle, simple periodic limit cycle. So whenever you see a limit cycle behind it in the physical uh, frame, is a modulated motion. Okay, this is another state you observe. And actually this state is similar to one of the experiments I showed you before in the complex play, namely where we had a bunch of uh, synchronized oscillators here shown in red and a bunch of incoherent oscillators here shown in blue. So this is in fact a chimera state, which we observe in this uh, ensemble of Stuart Lander oscillators with non-local coupling. And in the co-rotating frame, the picture looks as shown here, that we have a simple limit cycle for the synchronous oscillation and chaotic motion for all the incoherent oscillators. Now let's look a little bit in more detail on what uh, <clears throat> might happen or how these um, modulated clusters might further differentiate. So I chose again in the beginning example where we look at 16 coupled oscillators, synchronous oscillators. The synchronous motion becomes unstable in Hopf bifurcation, creating all type of modulated two um, cluster solutions here in this realization. We have the 8-8, the balanced cluster solution, which occurs. And as you change the parameter further, the parameter we changed was C2, um, the system <clears throat> becomes unstable, or this state, I should say, becomes unstable in a period doubling bifurcation. And one of the clusters splits into 
two clustered in the period doubling, which are shown now here in red and uh, yellow. And as you further change C2, you have another um, period doubling bifurcation. And again, one of the now three cluster state breaks apart, creating an 8422 cluster. And you might wonder how this goes on. And well, I'm not going to show you into detail uh, the behavior, but more in this overview um, diagram where the real part, uh, the maximum of the real part of the oscillator in a kind of orbit diagram is shown against the um, parameter. And you see this would be the 8422 cluster state that also here, the next bifurcation is a period doubling bifurcation, creating, well, not an 84211 state, but actually both of these clusters and this realization break up. There are different realizations possible, I should say, depending on small fluctuations in the system, but you have a third period um, doubling bifurcation. So if you like or want again from this scenario to extract some general rules, it's striking that you have a cascade or that you have at least successive period doubling bifurcations and that, that the period doubling bifurcations tend to split the smaller clusters into parts. Okay. Um, now, what about an ensemble of N oscillators? What can we learn from our simulations with 16 oscillators on large ensembles? Well, first of all, you should um, realize that all solutions for an ensemble size N will also be solutions for an ensemble size well, N prime, which is small, uh, small letter N times N. So <clears throat> you can upscale uh, the results for the solutions we have. And furthermore, because of the symmetry within the individual clusters, the permutation symmetry, we know that whenever a cluster size has, is uh, larger or equal to two, so when a cluster has at least two members, the stability properties will be the same for any upscaled version. So this is already something. Now let us look at larger ensembles. What you're seeing here is an example of an ensemble of 32. And in fact, you observe the same trend, just that here the period doubling bifurcation, which is also an equivalent bifurcation, um, produced a slightly asymmetric state, which might occur as well. And when you have a slightly asymmetric state, then the rule or the, the tendency for always a smaller cluster to break um, is larger than we, when you have balanced states. So here we really go from the 1616 over the 697 to a 6943 cluster to a 69421 cluster. And this is the end of this cascade. And when you start with 256 oscillators, well, you have the fur the first three oscillators in a similar manner. And then it goes on. So you end up in this case with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different clusters. One very large cluster being composed of half of the oscillators in your system, in this case, 128, one of 64, one of 33, 16, eight, four, two, one. So this initial period doubling cascade, which leads to a kind of hierarchical, a hierarchical patterning of space. You create clusters in all possible sizes. So it's, it's like a fractal pattern if this would be the case for n versus infinity, which we cannot show here. But it's the, the first cascade, which happens in different realizations, but always with the same tendency 
you pattern the space and you get um, clusters with widely different sizes. What comes next? Well, here I show you a detailed simulation. And if you try to see what is next, you see it is very difficult to see. But actually, I can tell you that you get a torus bifurcation. So this pattern state undergoes a secondary Hopf bifurcation. All dynamics becomes quasi-periodic. And later, you get a splitting of or breakup of the clusters. Let us look at this scenario in more detail. And this I do again for a simulation, but a simulation with much less oscillators and also an example for a very unbalanced state because there it's easier um, to explain and see what is happening. So here we are looking at 20 coupled oscillators and our two cluster state has a composition of 15 to five cluster. The state becomes unstable as we change C2 in a period doubling bifurcation, giving rise to a 15, three, two cluster, and a second period doubling bifurcation, giving rise to a 15, three, one, one cluster. So in this case, whenever the lowest, uh, smallest number in one cluster is just an individual, you usually do not find further period doubling bifurcations. But as I already um, indicated, Often the successive bifurcation is a secondary hop or a torus bifurcation. And the torus bifurcation kind of blows up your attractor in phase space. So you have a much larger volume the attractor occupies in phase space. And now, what you should have in mind is that you have a sheer infinite number of different permutations possible in large systems which are variants of these cluster states from the permutation symmetry. And as you change further um, the uh, C2, these variants start to grow further and collide at some point. And the variant that first collides are variants where you have a permutation or where you have different, different oscillators in the next second smallest cluster and individual cluster. And when this happens, this smallest group uh, has to break up. In this case, it gives rise to 15 and four individual clusters. And this con um, co contributes or is what is called a symmetry increasing bifurcation. Well, in average, uh, the symmetry of the corresponding attractors increase. And what you might also realize is that this is exactly what you can call a um, chimera state. So you have one synchronous cluster and five cluster with a chaotic dynamic. Because the symmetry increase in bifurcation also induces necessarily that the uh, dynamics became, uh, becomes chaotic. Okay, let me explain the symmetry increasing bifurcation a little bit more in detail. So I said, we are looking at highly symmetric um, equations with an SN um, symmetry, which are SN equivalent. And this means that if W of T is a solution, then so is gamma times W of T for all gamma element of our symmetry group. And this means that each solution, as I already tried to mention, exists in the form of several distinct symmetric variants in phase space. And let's look at this example of eight oscillators where we have one cluster of four in which the individual oscillators one, two, three, and four um, are present, one of two where oscillators five and six are present, and then two individual ones with oscillator seven and eight. And another variant, the oscillator, the large group has the same oscillators, but oscillator six and seven are exchanged. So in the group of two is now um, oscillator seven and oscillator six has its individual dynamics. 
When these two variants collide in phase space, um, this smaller cluster has necessary to break up because these two oscillators can neither be individual nor in the two cluster. So we get a, um, a final cluster distribution four and four times one. Okay, and now without going much more into detail, I can give you the larger picture what is happening when you start with a synchronized solution and change the parameter. And this should be seen as a simplification, not a detailed way, but kind of the um, qualitative uh, behavior. You start synchrony and a cluster splitting cascade leads, as I said, to a hierarchical patterning of space with clusters of all sizes, the smallest cluster being an individual oscillator. Then often the next bifurcation is a bifurcation which extends the size of the attractor in phase space like torus bifurc um, bifurcation or another Hopf bifurcation, secondary Hopf bifurcation. And then you have a cascade of symmetry increasing bifurcations where the symmetric variants which are closest in phase space collide first. And the ones which are closest in phase space are those where the smallest, two smallest cluster have different variants, different population of oscillators. So we have a whole cascade again from the symmetry increasing bifurcations, which split up one after the other, the then still existing smallest cluster, giving rise to individual dynamics of these clusters and a few large clusters remain. The penultimate bifurcation here is then the chimera, leads to a chimera state with one large cluster and all the other clusters having its individual dynamics. And finally, when a chimera state collides with a symmetric variant, we um, obtain turbulent behavior. Then all of the, uh, then also the largest cluster breaks apart and each oscillator is having its own dynamics. So there's a very high dimensional uh, dynamics. Okay, you might wonder how uh, general is this behavior? So I showed it to you for globally coupled, not uh, stuart lander oscillators with nonlinear coupling. You might have the feeling, well, we had a constraint in there. Isn't this a bit, um, well, non-generic? And actually it is observed in other systems as well. Um, Conneco studied already in the nineties and then later again in the tens or 10 years ago of uh, this uh, century globally coupled logistic maps. And he did not do or perform a complete bifurcation analysis, but he describes a different state that he observed. And so this first state here is a synchronous state where all N oscillators are synchronized. This is a two cluster state. This is a state with one two cluster and all individual oscillators. This is a partially synchronized state, which in our hierarchy, would be in the middle of the symmetry increasing cascade. And this is a, a completely turbulent state where each oscillator has its own dynamics. So although Kaneko did not discuss <clears throat> how the different dynamics he observed and indicated here are connected, it's very likely that it follows a similar uh, rule. We were interested in finding or looking at still other systems. So we set up a globally, also globally coupled maps, which are based on the normal form of a pitchfork bifurcation as shown here, globally coupled through this term. And in fact, also in this map, you find corresponding dynamics where I indicated 
the symmetry, uh, the, the cascade of period doubling cas um, bifurcations of the first period doubling um, bifurcations in these two uh, diagrams. And finally, I already told you, we were motivated to study the nonlinear globally coupled uh, Stuart Lander oscillators by our experiments. These are now experimental data where you look on the surface of a silicon um, wafer and the pseudo color can be understood like the thickness of the oxide layer on the silicon wafer. And what we find is a transition from a uniform oscillation to a modulated two cluster pattern, which could be this modulated. And we saw that we get modulated two cluster patterns in our nonlinear SL ensemble, nonlinear coupled SL ensemble. Then we have structures which look like substructuring with different domains of, uh, of different sizes, which, different with a, which oscillate with a different um, period. So this could be somewhere on the period uh, doubling cascade. Then we observe chimera states and finally states of pure turbulence. So there is no proof that these experiments really follow the scenarios, these two cascades I discussed, but at least they are um, in agreement with assuming that it uh, would be so. We try to, to pinpoint this experimentally down more precisely, but this is very difficult because as you can see, and also um, the uh, parameter different, uh, or the, the, the changes in parameters become smaller and smaller as you go into the interior of your cascades. Okay, now I'm at the end of my talk. I hoped I gave you some insight into the dynamics of amplitude um, oscillators and showed that there are um, situations where it is important to look at the amplitude degree of freedom. And I think some of you also work a lot on amplitude oscillators and that approaching the problem from smaller ensembles and a bifurcation theoretical point of view can give some insight also on very large ensembles. And here I summarize some of our recent work um, in this, uh, to this topic, which whoever is interested can um, have a look. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this very splendid talk. And uh, I request the audience to type your questions into the Q&A box. And uh, Katharina, you can look at them and answer whichever questions you wish to directly. You may have to stop sharing to be able to see the questions. Uh, sorry? You may need to stop sharing to be able to see the q and ah, Actually, I see the chat or... Oh, okay, you can see that, okay. Ah, maybe yeah. I, st I stopped the sharing, okay. Yeah, so I, I, in the meantime, if any of the panelists have any question, till the questions come up in the uh, Q&A box, you can ask. Yeah, go ahead, Louis. Um, actually, I don't find the questions. Could you read no, them? No, or? No, the, the, no, nobody has typed any questions. Yet. Ah, okay. So, are there any questions? Do you have questions? Yeah, Professor Catherine, it's a very beautiful talk. Um, Thank you. Uh, have you have you looked at uh, uh, symmetry breaking globally coupling? Uh, I mean. Symmetry preserving globally couple coupling and symmetry breaking globally uh, coupling uh, global coupling. Um, have you come across uh, differences in these two kinds of couplings? So I'm not sure I understand what you mean with symmetry preserving and symmetry breaking global coupling. For example, I mean, the, the kind of coupling you have taken uh, uh, some of some over all the uh, uh, all the oscillators uh, minus uh, uh, minus uh, W. So the kind of coupling you have taken is uh, uh, 
has a symmetry, rotation symmetry, but if you take the real parts of, of that. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah. No, so, we have not. Yeah, you can, you can get different transitions, uh, different kinds of transitions. I'm sure this is a very yeah. huge field and there's a lot to discover. And I also know that yeah. Sujit and yourself and also uh, Jürgen have beautiful works on coupled amplitude oscillators. Yeah, so and, you can get yeah. different kinds of clusters. Amplitude, the modulation. Different types of, of uh, couplers. Transitions to chi chimera states and so on. Transition to chimera states and yeah. also amplitude death is a very yeah. typical phenomenon you find in yeah. uh, amplitude. Um, so, have you come across amplitude deaths and so on? Chimera uh, deaths? We observed amplitude death in our experiments. No. And we are now, well, we, we are always driven, I mean, our theoretical work is driven by the experiments we are doing. And oh. since we have observed it just recently, we are now looking into more detail uh, into how the amplitude death is occurring in our case, because it's a partial amplitude death actually. So oh. only part of the electrode goes into a stationary state and the other part again forms clusters, but this time frequency clusters. So that's a different uh, clusters oscillate with different frequencies. And we have three clusters in this case, which um, so this type of frequency clusters have been observed uh, in, in models that try to describe an adaptive coupling. And I think this will also be responsible for the formation of the frequency clusters in our case. But since we don't have the theory yet, I didn't show you the experiments. <laughs> And do you do you quantitatively characterize these states? Yeah, there are lots of measures wow. like strength of incoherence and so on. So do you characterize these uh, cluster states and other states? Um, characterize the states um, from the experiments? Or? No, from theoretical analysis. So you have uh, lots of measures like strength of incoherence, discontinuity measures and so on. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So do you? Um, okay. Mm. It turns out that it is difficult for the special um, nonlinear global coupling we chose because we preserve the mean oscillation. Okay. So to find a good measure to characterize the ensemble dynamics from a type of order parameter um, is not easy. We haven't succeeded, let's so maybe somebody else uh, can do so. But whenever we can, yes, we do. But this would be different models from what I discussed so far. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. You're, very You're welcome. I think you had a question. Oh, actually, I cannot hear you. No, I cannot hear you, no. Okay, there's a, in the meantime, there's a question in the chat box, Q&A box. Can, can you see that? Okay. okay, yeah. In a very large ensemble, is it possible to control the number of oscillators at each branch of period doubling bifurcation? Or is it uh, deterministic? Okay. Um, this is yeah, a very good and important uh, question. Um, As I said, there is a multitude of coexisting solutions due to the symmetry in the system. And it is not possible really to control it. Uh, but if you add a bit of noise, you can do some statistics and look which um, solutions are the more robust ones, which occur more often. And these tend to be the more balanced solutions. And is, as you go through the period uh, doubling cascade, um, it very much depends on whether uh, you have in rather early a unbalanced solution in between or a balanced one. As I mentioned, the, if you create an unbalanced, slightly unbalanced solution, it's much easier to observe the entire cascade. So um, my main message is you do not observe a particular branch here, but the uh, overall scenario tends to be that you get a hierarchical patterning of space 
which might look different because of the strong um, or large multiplicity of possible paths um, and, and coexistence uh, patterns every time. But um, the, the uh, overall scenario is the same. Thank you. Uh, the qualitative you scenario. So yeah. there is. Sorry, Louis. Yeah, now, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, my, the microphone was set incorrectly. I don't know why. <laughs> but okay. um, that, that was a great talk. And it was nice Thank to see you. a talk that was, wasn't just simple, another phase oscillator research, but with a very deep analysis. Uh, I enjoyed that. Uh, I'm not sure I followed all of it. You got, there's a lot going on. But you, yeah. made, you made a comment at one point, which I wrote down, that if you know, um, say for n oscillators, you know the basic bifurcation structure, then for any integer multiple of that, you, you will, somehow that gives you information about the new uh, number of oscillators. Am I making that clear? It's like, if you already know about five, then if you multiply that by two, you have some idea of the structure. Mm -hmm. And just, okay, good, <laughs> I at least got that. But I just wondered then, it kind of tells me that there's something special about those number of oscillators that are prime numbers and that they, because then you can, of course, make any other number from them. And I'm wondering if there's any thoughts or, or if there's anything to that, or if, you, if you thought about it, just look at the prime numbers and maybe there's some pattern you can always talk about. Actually, um, this is a problem. I mean, we are still in the middle of our research and this is a hard problem to see this. We came yeah. up with this question, but not with an answer, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. Oh, good. All right. I was yeah. on the right track. <laughs> so there's good. still a lot to do. Good. Okay. Uh, thank Great. You. Thank you. Yes. You're welcome. I am here. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Very nice talk. It's thank you. Very nice to see the connection between the experimental studies and exactly the mm -hmm. numerical studies following. But I was just wondering if you have any odd number of oscillators. What will happen? You cannot have the balanced solution then, no? So what will happen instead of 16 or 20 or 30? Ah, okay. Ah. If you have an odd number, the first splitting uh, will be, I'm, I mean, uh, a nearly balanced state. I see. So it's, it's even easier with an odd number, but when we started the study, we didn't know this and made most of our um, investigations with this uh, power of two numbers. Mm -hmm. But as I said, whenever you have an odd number, um, you have kind of, uh, you discriminate between the um, emerging clusters and it's easier for the smaller one to follow the entire route. Okay. And in case the in intrinsic dynamics is chaotic, have you... Do you think um, the up? intrinsic dynamic becomes chaotic as soon as we have the um, symmetry breaking, uh, symmetry increasing bifurcation. Uh, to start First, instead of lander steward, for example, you have a Rosler oscillator, which is in the kind I mean, uh, the if you have a um, linear global coupled uh, Stuart lander oscillators and also with the nonlinear ones, you do also have chaotic states, but in the chaotic states, uh, the chaos is within the cluster manifold, mm. which means um, you, um, it without uh, breaking apart. You have two or three clusters, which actually it's three clusters which have chaotic dynamics. So my question was actually, suppose we start with a set of oscillators, each one is chaotic. Like Rosler in the ah, when we have uh, chaotic oscillators, uh -huh. we didn't study that. Yeah, I cannot I answer. It's an interesting uh, question, and there's still a lot to do. Okay. Good, um, good. Yeah. Thank you. But we have not studied that question yet. So, the audience have any other questions? You can type on Q and A, and the panelists are welcome to unmute themselves and ask the question. In the meantime, I have a question. If the oscillators are connectivity is in a more complex network, like a steel free network or something, would you see any interesting pattern? Okay, also this is a very interesting question. We have not yet looked into it. I 
my expectation is yes, but <laughs> we have to do it or somebody has to uh, look into this. We started with the simplest uh, type of coupling. Well, it's questionable whether it's really the simplest or not, because you have this high um, symmetry in the system. But anyway, this is how we started because also we have a global coupling in our experiments. But now we start with different connectivities of the electrodes in our experiment, which will then also lead to uh, or motivate us to study different connectivities between um, yeah, in, in the global couple Stuart London oscillators. Yeah, also to follow up on Amrita's question, uh, maybe if uh, you have uh, um, Rossler oscillators or something to begin with, maybe order can emerge? Yeah, it is something very interesting to look at that. But we had a uh, yeah. once, I, I will talk to you later. Okay, then okay, you, okay there great. Are, there are some uh, questions in the, uh, there's another question from Singh in chat box. Can you take a look? Okay. In the, in the Q&A, and there is one question in the chat. OK. So I read first the question, because <laughs> That's uh, a long question. in the case of 16 stuart Lana oscillators, a two-cluster state mean one set consisting of eight oscillators having equal amplitude and phase, and the other set left with eight oscillators having the same amplitude but antiphase to the first set. If yes, can a set of eight oscillators which are having same amplitude but not 100 degrees opposite come under a two cluster state. Okay, actually, it's not so. The two in the two cluster states, the um, two clusters have different, I mean, there are two types of solution. In one type of solution, yes, you are correct. The, um, we have a type of interface uh, solution and the clusters are essentially on the same limit cycle, but with an amplitude which scales with square root one over uh, uh, K minus one or one minus K, I forgot. But what I looked at is where the two classes have different amplitudes. So um, the amplitude of one cluster was smaller than one, and one is the amplitude of uh, the uniform oscillations, the synchronous state, and the other one was uh, larger than one. And they are not 180 degrees uh, out of phase, but have some other phase leg. There's one more question in the chat box. Uh, yes. Has similar kind of dynamic behavior has been observed in other experimental studies in different fields. I'm not aware of, of course, I would be very happy if so. And if anybody of you has or comes across it, please let me know, I would be very happy. <laughs> and then I think there's, so this was a, fr a question and answer, and then there's more in the chat. Is there a question in the chat or just? No, I think it's more appreciation. Oh, thank you. Yes. <laughs> so I guess, uh, will the panelists have any further questions? Uh, okay, looks like we are out of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think I uh, wish to thank you for this wonderful talk. And, well, I thank you for giving me the opportunity. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, uh, Jurgen had to leave because he had another meeting immediately right after this. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just want to uh, welcome everybody for the next talk by Professor Lexmanet. On 25th April, please do mark your calendars. I will send you uh, in Thank you all. Thank you. Bye bye.